All right, let's get started. Um, this is lecture 10. And we're going to wrap up on health and, or, you know, this sort of deworming example. And we're going to turn to uh, another issue, health issue, which is HIV AIDS, in the latter half of the lecture. So halfway through the lecture, so we'll make this, this transition. And we'll start with a little bit of overview of the problem and then talk about what some of the interesting economic questions are. Any questions before I get started? OK, so last time we went through a pretty extensive discussion of the health benefits, both direct benefits and externalities of deworming. And then we talked about school participation gains. And those are really the results in this, this older paper that some of you have read. But what I want to do is think about um, a cost-benefit calculation. This is going to draw on some more recent data uh, for a paper that's a working paper. It's not even published yet, and it's not on your, on your syllabus. When we think about the cost of a program like the deworming program that we um, studied, there's a couple different cost numbers you could think of using. Um, one is the actual cost of this program. This program at the time cost about $1.46 per pupil per year. Um, it turns out that part of the re you know, key determinant of the per pupil cost of a health program like this is the scale of the program, which makes sense. Uh, there just is a certain need in terms of management time and finding distributors and other things. Um, uh, certain costs you have to pay even for a relatively small program, like a program of 75 schools. When you get to a really large program, the per pupil cost falls because you're kind of spreading those costs over more and more, uh, more and more students. So for instance, around the same time we were doing our program, there had recently been a larger scale program, you know, 10 times as large or something, that cost about a third as much. So for instance, sometimes when you buy like very large amounts of the drugs, the women drugs, you get discounts, things like that. So um, that's a probably more realistic cost if we're thinking about a large-scale program. And actually, since then, the drugs have become even cheaper. So I'll talk in a couple minutes about a national program in Kenya that took place in 2009. And there, the cost was 36 cents per pupil. And that was at a scale of millions of kids. So a really, really large program, 8,000 schools. Um, so you know, the cost can be quite, quite cheap. And I will say that when you look at uh, cost, a non-trivial share of cost in our program, um, or you know, pretty, a pretty decent cost, was the cost of the non-drug component of the program. So I think we talked about this, that all schools, in addition to receiving deworming drugs, also received some education in worm prevention behaviors. So what are the kinds of behaviors you could take as an individual, like washing your hands before you eat, or you know, wearing sandals on your feet so you don't step on the hookworm larvae, not bathing in Lake Victoria so you don't get schistosomiasis. Um, so you know, there was the time, if we have some reasonable assumptions on the time of the NGO staff and the government staff working on the program, that would be about 34 cents per people per year. So um, you know, that's pretty uh, you know, relatively expensive uh, as well. Okay, so when we, that's the cost side. What about the benefit side? When we think about the benefit side, there's a lot of different things we could look at. Before even getting to the economics of it, we might want to think about just straight up health benefits. You know, kids who are treated for, for worms no longer have all these symptoms, they're, they're not as lethargic, they're not as anemic, they have more energy, they're happier. When people are healthier, they feel better, and there's some inherent value in feeling better, even if you're not any more productive economically. That is a very important you know, aspect of the problem. And uh, you know, in terms of what doctors prescribe, when kids have worm infections, they treat them. They, they don't worry about what the economic return is. They say, these guys are sick, we're going to treat them because they're just inherent benefits to, to having people be healthier. So, you know, there are those health gains. What I'm going to talk about today really kind of ignores those health gains and says, well, those health gains are there. They alone almost certainly justify treating people for worms. But on top of that, we're going to talk about all these economic productivity gains. And you could think of that as gravy on top of the basic health gains. Uh, or you know, maybe if you're a minister of finance or you're some government official, you really do care about the productivity gains. Maybe you put some you know, more weight on that than you do on these fuzzier concepts like people feeling healthier. But that's not how we really see it. We think health gains are inherently important, but um, they are hard to quantify. So what are the, so let's think about these, these health gains. What, is the, the, what are the outcomes we're going to focus on? What do we think of as the likely mechanisms? We're going to focus a lot in this new working paper that, that we have. I'll summarize the results in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, we're focusing on adult labor market outcomes mainly. So one of the reasons why you might think that investing in child health is important from a public policy point of view is if kids really are healthier when they're young, maybe they get more schooling. Maybe those health investments in youth translate into better health in adulthood. And both of those channels and, and any combination of them could feed into adult labor market performance. So when people are sick, they may not be able to attend work as often. They may not be as productive. If people have less schooling, they may not be as productive. They may not be able to get as good a job as if they have more schooling. So that's our thinking about the channels. And what I'll talk about here is just some of the summary statistics on, on earnings when people are adults, because we managed to follow up this sample of deworming kids 10 years later, and we're able to actually look at them in their young adulthood and measure things like their earnings in surveys, measure things like how many hours they were working. And we also got pretty detailed information on the types of jobs they were doing. And that's a pretty interesting part of the story, actually. So if you think having better health actually allows you to access different types of jobs, especially in a setting like Kenya, where many people, the majority of the population, are engaged in manual labor. So 50% you know, of our sample are still in subsistence agriculture. And a large share of people, even outside of agriculture, are working at uh, what you can think of as manual labor jobs, working in manufacturing, working in, in, on construction sites, uh, domestic work, et cetera. So one's health status would be a very important determinant of your success in those jobs or ability to even access those jobs. Let me pause for a second. As we think of this sort of chain of causality, I kind of highlighted the, the most obvious mechanisms in the middle there, the schooling and the health. What are other mechanisms you might think of as being important mediators of the effect of child health on life outcomes? Life, sort of adult economic outcomes and labor market outcomes? That are missing here. Yeah? Oh, so, you're, so the, the, when the kid was a child, if they were healthier, their parents could actually be working more at the time. I see. So that's, that's a really interesting channel. And it, it isn't a health gain for the parent per se, but it frees up time. Instead of having to stay home with a sick kid, those extra days of the year, you know, which I showed you the school participation gains last time, they could work more, invest more, go to school more, do whatever they were doing. So that's, that's really interesting. Maybe those income gains for the parents help launch the kid, too, because there's more resources around for the kid to you know, get schooling or buy stuff. Okay, so that's a, that's a very interesting channel. What are some other channels other than these two? Yeah. Yeah, so it's a sort of interesting extension of this one. Instead of just the time, it's saying if the kid is healthier, you're also saving money that you would have spent on, say, other medical care, potentially. And maybe that, that changes the sort of child uh, investment, human capital investment decisions, is what you said. Okay, so it's an interesting extension. In the back. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So even if that doesn't necessarily translate into the beneficiary's own labor market outcomes, there could be almost like a further step in the chain in saying, like, maybe the next generation will benefit because this generation had better health, they learn the value of better hygiene or worm prevention behaviors, or they had different opportunities. So, you know, one of the things we want to do, we're kind of busy thinking about fundraising for in terms of future research, is even more data collection on the children of our deworming beneficiaries. So that's kind of like a next step. First, let me show you what happens to these guys in the long run, then we can talk about the sort of intergenerational aspects. Any other ideas or thoughts on channels? Or ways that your life changes when you're healthier as a kid? Yeah, more?
So basically, if you're healthier, you get more schooling, you have better opportunities, say, in the labor market. And that may change these fundamental decisions about whether to join a rebel group, engage in crime, or other things. You know, thankfully, um, Kenya hasn't had a civil war. They have had some civil violence. They've had, you know, some organized violence. And so um, maybe this is the relevant decisions behind, you know, between uh, joining some sort of organized crime gang or not, or, you know, engaging in that sort of lifestyle or not. Okay? Great. So let's actually talk about the impacts. So what we did, and this is a working paper on... Um, my website with Sarah Baird, Joan Hammer, Hicks, and Michael Kramer, as well, is we followed up the learning kids 10 years after the start of the project. So the project started in 98, we followed them up between 2007 and 2009, and um, we surveyed them. And the, in the analysis that I'll talk about now, basically for simplicity, we grouped the group one and two schools together as treatment, and group three as control, just to maintain this kind of binary treatment control, makes things a little simpler. Um, Groups one and two received between two to three additional years of deworming beyond what group three received. Because group one was phased in 98, group two in 99, and group three in 2001. So this is kind of the, the main cut uh, in the data. And you know, most, of the fun, most of the funding we got for the research went into finding folks. That was really the, the hard part of the, of the study was you know, 10 years later, uh, and we had done some intermediate surveys, so actually we had been maintaining contact with, with the sample along the way. But 10 years later, we were able to find and survey 85% of them. And that rate is almost identical in the treatment and control group, you know, identical across groups one, two, and three, within like a percentage point. Um, that's, this in a longitudinal survey is a high survey tracking rate over 10 years. Usually the, the survey tracking rates are lower, much lower than this. Um, so, you know, if at least we're capturing data on 85% of the sample, we can have some confidence that what we're talking about is broadly uh, representative. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so even group three, eventually, three years later, was phased into uh, deworming. So they got a couple of years of deworming at that point before the program kind of shut down. Um, and groups one and two received two to three additional years. So there's still a differential treatment for those two, you know, up to three additional years of childhood, say in group one, they, were, they had better health and nutrition than the kids in group three. So there's still a difference there, um, but it might in some ways understate the impact we might have seen had there been a pure control group, like you said. So in terms of why we don't take a pure control group, you know, the issue is within the original experimental sample, eventually everybody got phased in. So we don't have a control group. We have to, our control group would have to be schools outside of the initial sample, and um, you know, then we'd be concerned that they're not, they're not comparable to our sample. You know, what we could have done, we hadn't done this, but it would be interesting is maybe look at schools in nearby divisions, you know, geographic divisions, where there was no mass learning going on at the time. So that'd be one way to go. Um, but because of the experiment, Phasing everybody in eventually. This is sort of the best we can do to maximize the variation in, in treatment status. But but it's a it's a fair point that we may be understating the effects of a pure control versus treatment for sure. Yeah. There have been plenty of experiments where the control group never gets phased in. You know, there have been like literally scores and scores of field experiments in development over the last 15, 16 years. And um, we'll talk about some even later on in the, in the term where the control group never gets phased in. So uh, here the um, NGO we were working with and, and, and together with us came up with this plan, knowing this was a very high worm in, in, you know, intensity area. And the kind of plan and the deal we came up with was this phase in. Because eventually the NGO, as they expanded over time, was, it started as quite a small NGO, they actually raised quite a bit of money to, to do this. As they grew over time, they agreed to do the expansion of the phase in randomly, but eventually they did want to deworm everybody in the area, so we went with that. But um, there are plenty of experiments where you never phase in control group. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the question is what average to use. You know, what, what average, what population was comparable to our sample at baseline? And that's where we run into some difficulty. You know, it goes back in some sense to this fundamental advantage of running an experiment in a given population, because then you really know because of the randomization you have comparability. So I think that was the kind of concern with going outside the sample. I will say one thing, which is because of the three-year delay, the three oldest grades in the group three schools had graduated from elementary school by the time the phase-in happened. Other folks may not have um, graduated, but they may have dropped out by that time. There's actually very high dropout rates. So when you actually look, especially at the older three or four grades in elementary school, very few of those folks received the warning in 2001 because they left school. So those grades are closer to what you would think of as like a pure control group. Now, among the younger grades, if they did remain in school, then they would have received a couple of years of deworming treatment as well. Yeah. You guys can't see it. There are these knobs. There's a chemistry table sticking out. I mean, you must think I'm just awful. Is it working? Go ahead. Yeah. It's all just the original sample. So it's all the original kids. It's all the original kids, and we follow them over time. I mean, a lot of these concerns are things, of course, we thought about, but they made us think, like, well, because of the group three guys eventually got phased in, that's going to kind of really dampen the differences between groups one, two, and three. You know, the, the opposite argument as well, you know, group one got three additional years of good health and childhood, these critical years for development and whatnot. Um, so that may make our results even a little more remarkable, which I'll, which I'll show you, because we do find impact. So despite the fact that group three eventually got phased in, we're going to find differences here. Um, okay, so what do we find? Well, first we have to track people down. It's not a little hard to read. The percentages show the percent of people from our sample that lived for at least four months' time between 1998 and the follow-up survey 10 years later in some of those locations. So if you guys can make it out, it's a little fuzzy. It says like Busia and then K. Can you see where it says Busia K on the left? That's the original study district. That's 100% because at baseline, everybody lived in the study district. That's how we sampled them, right? Um, so these numbers add up to more than 100 because this is you live there at some point and people move. So 21% of the sample lived in Nairobi for at least four months over that period. So there's quite a bit of migration to the cities. Um, another 8% lived in Mombasa or 7% on the coast. And you know, these are often urban areas. Mombasa is a big city as well. So another, say, 15% were on the coast, mainly in cities. Um, 11% of the sample went to what says Busia U. So the district on the, of the Uganda side of the border is also called you know, Busia. There's Busia, Uganda, Busia, Kenya. Um, a fair share of the sample lived at some point in Uganda. And another few percent were in, another percent was in Kampala. So the sample moved a lot. And that made the tracking really challenging because we had to send our survey teams to all these places to do surveys and, and, and get data to track people down. And that's really what took most of the, the, the money. And it's like a backbreaking field activity because you. Um, you know, the, the odds are long at the start to find someone. You know someone's going to Nairobi, you have to sort of talk to their friends, their family, their neighbors, get a phone number, set up a meeting. It can take four or five contacts until you reach the, the person you want. Although I will say that over time, our job has really become easier. Like, we have even higher tracking rates for the current round in the field because cell phones are just so widespread now that as long as people keep their cell phone number, we can reach them and text them and set up meetings and, uh, and stuff like that. So um, we thought over time our tracking rates would be falling, but because of technology, now they're starting to inch up actually above 85%. So that's, that's actually really lucky. Um, okay, so what we find, we find pretty large effects. When you look at people 10 years later, on average, 
In the treatment group, people had attended 0.3 of a year more schooling on average. Now, of course, some people have attended much more schooling than that. Um, some of these education gains, interestingly, are concentrated, even though you see some among males, they're concentrated more among, among the females in the sample. So among the females in the sample, females in the control group, so this is control group females, 32% had attended some secondary school 10 years later. About a third had attended some high school. In the treatment group, again, this is females, 41% had attended some secondary school. That's a huge effect. That's an increase of almost a third. And this is you know, significant with a p-value less than 0.1. Very highly statistically significant effect. For males, there's smaller gains that tend not to be statistically significant. But you see these really large gains. So these sort of average schooling gains are really driven by the females. Uh, in terms of health, we have self-reported health. And we, we use you know, a series of a few different questions. You find very significant in improvements in self-reported health in the treatment group. They're much more likely to say they're in very good health. Um, now, we did not take uh, sort of samples to get at worm infection rates. There's a couple reasons for that. The logistics of doing so are complicated. A. B. We actually don't think that these guys are healthier because they have fewer worm infections necessarily 10 years later because of reinfection. Remember, worms have a pretty short lifespan. The most plausible channel is the better adult health is a legacy of having been in better health and nutrition for multiple years as a child. That somehow that leaves some legacy. So with one other measure of improved health, and again, it's the females that seem to show some of these, which is in the treatment group, we found, and this is all reported by the women in the treatment and control group, but we asked them to report each pregnancy they had had, regardless of the outcome of the pregnancy. And you know, it could have ended in miscarriage, it could have ended in abortion, it could have ended in birth, it could have ended in stillbirth. We had a very detailed series of questions. The females in the treatment group have significantly fewer miscarriages. They have very similar, almost identical numbers of pregnancies, but significantly fewer reported miscarriages. And in general, it's thought that the miscarriage rate correlates with uh, the women's health and nutrition. That women who are healthier, better nourished, et cetera, are going to be less likely to have miscarriage. So this is another measure that suggests that these women, at least, are healthier and adults. Yeah. Ten years. Ten years. So the, most of the sample, by the time we do the follow-up, are between 19 and 26. That's the bulk of, of the age. Um, and a lot of Kenyan women in that age range have had, the, the median women have already had a kid in the sample, because people tend to have kids younger. So the average number of pregnancies is maybe 1.5 or 1.7 by that point. So there's a fair number of sort of average pregnancies in that age range. Yeah. These beneficiaries own mothers at the time, you mean? We, we do have data on the siblings of our beneficiaries. So we could back that out. We haven't really looked at it. Tell me what, what the, the kind of thinking of, of the channel were. Mm -hmm. So you're saying looking at the mother. So we, we, we don't have that kind of detailed health data on the mother. We do have a kind of birth of later siblings. So we could look at if you know, the treatment changed pregnancy patterns or birth patterns, but we don't, uh, we don't look at that. But it's interesting to think about. Yeah. You know, one um, thing I, I may have mentioned briefly before, but I'll um, just write, write on the board. A couple years ago, I think it's 2011, uh, I think I mentioned this. Owen Ozer was a former student here. He looked at kids who were um, between in utero to age three in 1998. So he looked at the kids in these same communities who were really, really young. So try to get it's a little bit what you're saying, like, did the overall health environment improve? And he compares the kids you know, in, these, in these very young ages between, say, group one, group two, and group three, knowing the phase of deworming at different times. And he finds that the kids that were between in utero um, zero or one, so before age two, the very, very young kids who are in communities where mass treatment was going on, they have a variety of nutritional and educational gains 10 years later. So while we were doing our follow-up survey on the original beneficiaries, he was doing surveys on people who were basically infants or in utero when the program was going on in these same areas. And he found these positive legacies. So it's sort of like another type of spillover, basically, because these guys didn't get the drugs when they were zero or one. Um, but they're scoring much better on tests 10 years later. So there's something about the improved health and nutrition at those very early ages that could affect cognitive development. That's basically his interpretation. So it's related to your point that there look to be broader spillovers. Go ahead. Yeah. We've collected survey data on that. So throughout our surveys, we've always asked the question to our respondents and to others, are you going and getting deworming yourself? In, in these follow-up surveys, because a lot of our respondents have kids, we say, are you going out to get deworming for your kids? Thinking, oh, they benefited themselves, so they're going to deworm the next generation. And they don't. Almost no one goes out on the private market and buys deworming drugs in this setting. So the kind of absent these, in these large-scale programs, the vast majority of people will actively consent to get the drugs for free, but very few people will go out in this kind of poor rural area and pay for the drugs. And that's one of the striking things. I actually was going to spend a little more time on the kind of demand for deworming. I've, I've kind of cut out of these slides. I want to get to HIV. Um, but if you're interested, Kramer and I have a follow-up paper all on the, the take-up decision for deworming drugs. It's all about these questions of like, why aren't more people taking deworming despite the benefits we're showing? And so that's a paper by Kramer and I that came out in 2007 in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, which is on my website. Um, so you might you know, want to want to read over that, and it tries to understand the economics of it in a little more detail. But I'm probably going to glide a little bit over that today for reasons of time. Yeah. Can anybody think of reasons for doing that? So it's a very good question. We've run the analysis with this assigned treatment years as well. But can